Traces of civilizations that were born, grew, and then disappeared over the centuries can be found in most countries around the world. Sometimes they perished from unknown causes, sometimes they were destroyed by the violent onslaughts of new conquerors. The ruins we admire today emerge from the mists of time. Many of them are perfectly aligned astronomically, with huge stones molded into elaborate forms that are truly astonishing feats of engineering. Structures so massive and sophisticated that they would be a challenge even to modern technology. Some of the most fascinating archaeological sites in the world are in Peru. These have been carefully studied for many years, leading to the discovery of traces which range from faint to surprising, impossible to interpret with the tools and knowledge we currently possess. Traces can be found in the ancient remains, in archaic myths, in the oral traditions handed down from lost people, even in the chronicles of the conquistadores. Gods who mingled with men and built fantastic cities bound by massive walls. Mysterious tunnels that are believed to have once linked these ancient sites. Bearers of knowledge and civilization. Divinities who traveled the four corners of the earth and knew how to fly. There is a strange similarity between the ruins and myths found in many parts of the world, almost an echo of a long lost forgotten civilization, a highly developed breed of superior beings who disappeared thousands of years ago. A mother culture we have no memory of. Attracted by the mystery and magnetic pull of these places, we set off to explore them and capture their essence on film. Lima greeted us in a welter of color and noise. Founded by Francisco Pizarro in 1535, Lima is the modern capital of Peru, its largest city with a population of almost 8 million. We were welcomed to the Lima Geographical Society by the president, Admiral Raul Paramasa. Helped by him and the honorary president, Dr. Santiago Antunes de Maiolo. We consulted various maps to decide on the best itineraries and to see what data the Geographical Society had on the themes we were researching. We explored their library, looking for further evidence to back up our own findings. The Society has some very important historical documents in its archives. Founded in 1888, it is in constant touch with the other Peruvian institutes and universities it collaborates with. Much has already been explored, but there is still so much to discover. There are still unexplored areas in Peru. For example, I found a reference in a book to a temple. I think it was called Tumpos Caica, above Caras, which has two underground tunnels, but nobody knows exactly where they are, and nobody has explored them yet. And many other tunnels have been discovered in other parts of Peru. The same goes for Trevin. We don't know all about that either. Trevin hasn't been explored. Next, we went to see Professor Federico kaufmann Doig, one of Peru's leading archaeologists. He gave his views on the underground tunnels. There's a book on tunnels. It was published around 1880. All about the traditions. Anyway, what's interesting is that today, but even when I was a child, wherever you go, you hear about these tunnels. I think it ought to be looked into. Not just at Cusco, because we didn't get very satisfactory results there. But around the country, in all those places where people say, there's a tunnel here, there's the entrance to a tunnel. We ought to put all the information together. It's very interesting. It's something that really should be done to make the past come alive again. Given all the information we had, we decided to start our adventure in Cusco. 
The 600-mile trip in the jeeps from Lima to Cusco isn't easy. The road runs through a desert, almost like the surface of the moon. We feel a bit alienated. Even more so because the plateaus are really high and the lack of oxygen makes everything more tiring. Tiny clumps of houses break the monotony every now and again. And occasionally, we see the friendly face of a llama or something very like it. Occasionally, unexpected hitchhikers thumb a lift, ephemeral visions which appear out of nowhere. On account of various problems, and even some landslides which had blocked the way, we end up in Cusco after 27 hours on the road, absolutely exhausted by the effort and the altitude. Cusco is 11,200 feet above sea level and has a population of 300,000. The ancient Inca Empire was called Taiwantisuyu. Cusco was its capital. Cusco means navel of the world. Here you can still see the remains of ancient Inca buildings and temples that the Spanish incorporated into their own buildings. Some of them are particularly interesting from a construction point of view so surprisingly sophisticated that they would represent a challenge even to modern builders. This dry stone wall is really astonishing. Huge blocks of stone weighing hundreds of pounds in solid granite, delicately chiseled and fitted one on top of the other without any mortar apparently haphazardly, shaped as if they'd been made of soft plastic clay. How were these massive stones transported and set in place? How could the people of this ancient civilization fit them together so perfectly without the help of modern technology? The Incas hadn't discovered the wheel, but their building techniques bear witness to an amazing knowledge of engineering and architecture. This stone has 12 corners and fits perfectly into the ones around it. You couldn't get a knife blade between them, but no mortar has been used. It weighs hundreds of pounds, but it isn't one of the largest. On the other side of the building, the stones form a pattern representing the outline of a puma. Amazingly clever craftsmanship. There's a stone with 14 corners on the wall of a nearby building. It's smaller than the other, but the craftsmanship and its polygonal shaping is still wonderful. And there are still plenty of surprises to see in the Inca capital. A promontory rising on the outskirts of the city dominates Cuzco. This is the site of the ruins of Saxay Yuaman, said to be a fortress, or possibly a temple, or perhaps both. We don't really know. The only sure things are the incredible huge blocks of stone used to build its massive walls. Once again, we find shaped stones which fit perfectly together. But this time, we're talking about blocks that are 26 feet high and weigh over 300 tons. An impossible giant puzzle, designed by a superman. Back in the 17th century, the writer Gazilazo de la Vega, after visiting the walls of Saxay Yuaman, said in his royal commentaries of the Incas, it seems as if they were built by some form of magic, a work carried out by demons rather than mortal men. How did the Indios manage to quarry the stones, transport them, work them, and then build walls with such precision? They had no iron or steel to perforate the rock with, and to cut and smooth the blocks. 
They had no carts and no oxen to transport them. And in truth, there are no carts or oxen anywhere in the world strong enough to carry out a similar task given the huge size of the stones and the difficult mountain paths they traveled over. This monolith is amazing. And this one, it's huge and fits in perfectly with the ones around it. Really breathtaking. Saksai Yuaman's massive walls are built on three levels. Each level is a perfectly leveled terrace. The wonderful pattern of enormous stone blocks fitting together perfectly is repeated on each level. The extremely precise joins are repeated over and over again. Who designed and built this gate? They must have been giants. To make a comparison, we moved to a site a few miles out of Kutsko. We went to see a building that has been historically identified as a fortress. It's called Puka Pukara. Puka Pukara means the red fortress, so-called because of the color of the rock used to build it. Strategically placed to dominate the surrounding countryside, the Incas were able to control and defend one of the approaches to Cuzco from here. The building technique is undoubtedly less sophisticated here than at Sacsayhuaman and Cuzco. The stones are much smaller. You can see that an attempt has been made to copy the polygonal pattern we admired before, but even if the blocks are much smaller, the workmanship is rougher and the stones don't fit together as well. Our doubts increase. Did the Incas really build the walls we saw in Cuzco and the huge structures at Saksai Yuaman? The discrepancy between the sites makes it seem doubtful. We walk over the whole complex, but the workmanship on the walls is the same everywhere. And we begin to really wonder, who built the huge constructions at Kutsko and Saksayuaman? Here we get a helping hand from Inca tradition. Legend says that these incredible constructions were already old when they arrived. In other words, the Incas settled on pre-existing sites, which they restored and enlarged. Inca tradition also tells us about the original builder. In ancient days, after a terrible cataclysm, which had reduced men to the levels of beasts, a being came from the south with superhuman powers. He founded a new civilization, teaching the sciences, agriculture, and the arts. He taught men to live in harmony, animated by a spirit of altruism, a being accompanied by followers called the Faithful and the Shining. A being who had incredible skills. He could move in the sky and float on water. One of his symbols is lightning, and his name means God of Storms. He had white skin and a beard. His name was Viracocha. A divinity who could move in the sky thousands of years ago, who could fly, a divinity or the survivor of an ancient, highly developed civilization with sophisticated scientific and technological knowledge. This is what the legend implies, and Saksayo Aman has other surprises for us. There's a strange construction on the summit of the promontory with its massive walls. It is perfectly round, with three concentric circles intersected by walls radiating out in spokes. The circles are enclosed by another square building connected to the foundations of other square or rectangular buildings. When we check the orientation of the square building enclosing the circular construction, we found that the corners were perfectly aligned with the cardinal points of the compass, and that the walls intersecting the circles run northeast, southeast, northwest, and southwest. 
ideal orientation for determining the summer and winter solstices. Are these the ruins of an astronomic observatory? Who knows? But the concept of the whole building is extremely advanced. There are very few similar examples in the whole of South America. It is certainly very ancient, older than the Incas. Everything we'd seen at Sacsay Yuaman seemed to belong to a remote age, a time we have no human memory of, an age lost in the mists of time. Is this a completely lost story? Perhaps not. Descendants of the Incas still live in the mountains in remote pockets, isolated from white men. Groups which escaped the fury of the conquistadores. Their leaders are wise old men, custodians of ancient knowledge. Some people have talked to them. We were given a place, Samanawazi, and a name, Anton Ponce de Leon. Anton has written various books on his experiences and this ancient knowledge. Inspired by the teaching, he has founded and provided funds for a community where, with the help of his wife, Regia, abandoned children and old people are looked after. The rest home was translated into Samanawazi. An old man explained this knowledge to me in 10 to 15 minutes, using very simple words. But I was a very rational man, and I didn't believe him. I couldn't accept that the truth was so simple. This knowledge is still valid today. It's still relevant despite the passing of time. And I'm talking about thousands of years. This is an oral tradition which has been handed down, intact. These enormous buildings with their huge stone blocks Yes, some people say they were built by beings from outer space, but I don't think so. All the buildings in this world were built by human beings, who certainly had very wise teachers. According to what I learned, these teachers came from a continent which disappeared, submerged by the Pacific. It was the biggest continent of all, called Mu, sometimes erroneously called Lemuria. It was a continent called Mu, a word that comes from a very ancient language and means mother country. The Murians, who for us are the third race, were very highly developed physically, psychically and spiritually a level of development we haven't achieved yet. Moving large, heavy objects represented no particular problem for them. These teachers instructed the people of the Andes, our ancestors who built these wonderful constructions. We believe that the Murian civilization which had reached the Andes went out west too, towards Asia. That's why we find the same knowledge all over the world. Is this the answer? Was Mu, a lost civilization we have no memory of, the mother of all known civilizations? According to the wise people of the Andes, this is the key to many mysteries of the past, but we have other clues to follow up. Kenko is a few miles to the east of Sacsayhuaman. Its name could hardly be more appropriate given what we saw. It means intersecting channels. The huge rock, deeply eroded around its base, is carved into a very strange shape at its summit. It's chiseled, carved and molded to create an absurd maze of seemingly random shapes with no apparent meaning. It's incredible. It almost makes you dizzy. What's the meaning of those short staircases, those little platforms, those channels, those balconies? It's a real puzzle, impossible to guess the answer. Did the Incas make it? Was it something to do with their religious functions? That's what we're told, but we don't really know what to think. This disturbing rock puzzle could have been carved 500 years ago, or 5,000 or 50,000, who knows? We'd never seen anything like it. It seemed to have no logic. 
there's a large opening at the base of the massive rock. We go in. Inside is a fairly large cave with a carved rock. It looks like an altar. Later, we're told that the Incas used it for their religious ceremonies. This explanation is certainly in keeping with its appearance and that of the other carved rocks in the cave. But the incredible maze outside looks much older, designed and created by other hands and other minds. Perhaps the Incas had found these strange ruins and turned them into a temple, believing them sacred. That's one explanation. The style and condition of the stone seem to back it up. The walls and monolith outside look closer to the Inca style. But not quite. We know there's another site, a few miles away, with similar carved rock. We have also found out about a passage which accesses a network of seemingly endless underground tunnels. Many people have ventured in to explore, never to emerge again. It's called the X Zone. Here we get a real surprise. The rock looks like an exact copy of the one at Kenko. The same patterns carved in absurd positions. Stairs that lead to nowhere, completely off center. Why put steps in that position? Were they for walking on or what? On one side, we discover something that looks like a throne, but it's facing a wall of rock. It's crazy. The rocks at Kenko and the Exxon look out of place, almost as if they were once part of the same project which no longer exists. We search for the entrance to the underground tunnels and get a nasty surprise. The local authorities have blocked it up to stop other people wandering in and getting lost. We feel like getting down to work with picks and shovels and opening it up again, but we repress the urge and decide to be patient. The tunnels exist. All we have to do now is find a way in. These enigmatic sites are very puzzling. Their discrepancies are unsettling. We meet someone who has spoken to other wise men. According to him, direct descendants of the survivors of the destruction of Mu. They live in very remote areas in the heart of the Amazon basin, isolated from white people. His name is Ruben Iwaki Hordones. He has Indio blood in his veins and he tells us an amazing story about the origins of the rocks at Kenko and the X zone. Right here, where the city of Cusco is now. In ancient times, there was a lake. And under this lake, under its bed, there was an underground temple. About 250 feet underground. The wise ones lived down there. The ancient ones who governed the continent wisely. And the entrance to this place was on the hill. The same hill that's called Saksai Waman today. That's where the entrance was. After 10,000 years, there was a cataclysm on the planet. It destroyed the temple, and the lake above it flooded. This cataclysm wasn't an earthquake. It was much more. There were volcanic eruptions. Here, too. Here, where the temple was, there was a volcanic eruption. A terrible explosion. In Saksai Waman, there's an area where the lava has solidified. But that explosion produced fragments of exploding rock too. Burning pieces of rock. The force of the explosion shattered the rooms of the temple and fragments were thrown into the air and fell here, there and everywhere. There's one that nowadays is called Kenko. The Incas found it like that. They found these wonderful constructions and they used them for their religious ceremonies because they realized how important they were. They knew where they came from. 
There are other fragments as big as this room in an area near the solidified lava. There you can see upside down staircases. Well, these fragments came up from underground when the disaster happened. And they fell. They fell haphazardly. Upside down. And this shows that they were part of what was underground. Once again, ancient traditions insist on the existence of once great civilizations which have now disappeared, and Cuzco still has some mysteries in store for us. The most sacred and important temple in the whole of the Inca Empire was at Cuzco. It was dedicated to Viracocha, and it was called Coricancha, or the Golden Enclosure the Spanish-built Santo Domingo Cathedral on its ruins. But the ancient walls can still be seen both from inside and outside the latter-day colonial church. The walls are still imposing and very cleverly crafted. But the stones themselves are much smaller than in the other structures we had visited. More a building that Inca architects might have designed. There are tunnels under the church. A story tells of how some boys got lost in them in 1920. After a whole week, only one of them re-emerged, injured and confused. He died soon afterwards, clutching a solid gold cob of corn. There are no written records to confirm the story, but the people of Kutsko assure us it's true. We managed to get permission to visit the digs made by other researchers who had been trying to unravel the puzzle of the mysterious tunnels and climb down under the church. We followed the tunnel for a while, but are brought up short. The tunnel is blocked. Later, we're told that the excavations were stopped because of the risk of undermining the foundations of the church above. We wonder whether the Coracancha tunnels led to a more impressive network of underground tunnels, perhaps those that connected Cuzco, Sacsayhuaman, and other places even further away. But we'll have to wait for answers to these questions. The fact is, the tunnels exist, and their existence is backed up by ancient traditions. Traditionally, the tunnels are supposed to have gone from Cusco towards Quito in Ecuador. And from the south, they went towards what is today Bolivia, towards Chile, towards the forest, towards Brazil. They went everywhere. Unfortunately, some of them were blocked up for safety reasons when they were discovered. So nowadays, it's very difficult to find the entrances. I know, I'm sure, that they exist. I saw some of them with my father when I was a child. And I know that there are tunnels under the Catholic churches. We discover that another church in Cuzco has tunnels, the Church of the Jesuits. It was built in 1576 on the foundations of the Amarucancha, the royal palace of the Inca ruler Uwayacapac. When the Spanish arrived, Uwayacapac's two sons, Uoascar and Atahualpa, were waging a civil war for control of the empire. This helped the Spanish conquer the Inca kingdom. The church houses some important works of art. One of the most important pieces is the altar carved in cedar wood and covered in gold. It was by the Italian sculptor Bernardo Vitti. After long talks, we managed to get permission to explore underground this church too. There's a small, beautifully decorated chapel under the altar. This is where the trapdoor that accesses the tunnels is. 
The heavy cover hasn't been lifted for a long time. We're very excited as we get ready. This is the first time cameras have been allowed to film the tunnels. The entrance is small and difficult to get into. Once we manage to climb down, we get a disappointment. The tunnels are blocked after only a few meters. The ecclesiastical authorities ordered them to be blocked for security reasons. The tunnels run under the city and in the past have been used by thieves as a way into the church. But once more they confirmed that the Inca's sacred places were connected by a network of tunnels. Did the Incas build them? Ancient tradition believes not and we find echoes in the chronicles of the conquistadores themselves. In 1571, Juan Polo de Ondegardo wrote, The city of Cuzco was the home and residence of the gods. Every fountain, well and wall concealed a mystery. We leave Cuzco on the trail of more Peruvian mysteries. The fortress of Ayantaytambo dominates the valley of Urubamba, clinging to a hill about 300 feet high. It was the Inca's main fortification to defend the sacred valley. It was here that Pizarro experienced one of his few defeats during his campaign to conquer the huge empire of the sun. Characterized by its terraces used for farming, the settlement developed up to the summit of the hill. It was an important military, religious and agricultural center about 60 miles to the northwest of Cuzco. About two-thirds of the way up the steep steps that lead to the top of the hill, the familiar walls appear with their usual astonishing craftsmanship. Extremely large, heavy, skillfully worked polygonal stones fitting perfectly together with no mortar or any other type of cement. Again, we wonder, is this Inca work? The archaeologists say it is, but on one wall we find a stretch that has been repaired. It must have been done by the Incas. But strangely, the repair work has been carried out using much smaller stones, and the level of craftsmanship is much rougher. Why? Perhaps the Inca architects had forgotten their once sophisticated techniques, or were the original builders not Incas? That seems to be the most likely answer. There are a row of ten trapezoidal niches on the wall of the terrace where the main entrance once was. The joins are incredible, with absurd angles. They look almost ironical. Did they have a practical purpose, or were they just showing off the craftsmanship of the builders? As we climb higher, the walls still show the same level of incredible workmanship as the ones we've just seen. top of the hill, we find the ruins of the houses which once belonged to the Inca priests and nobles, while the populace lived in houses further down. There are other remains on the slopes of the hill in front. Archaeologists say that they were once grain storage warehouses. But although they are very interesting, our attention is attracted by something else. On the top of the hill, a series of huge red porphyry monoliths form a mad puzzle, lying scattered around on the ground in no apparent order, some of them weighing dozens of tons. Some are accurately carved, others are obviously unfinished. An amazing structure rears up out of this chaotic scene. Six enormous monoliths perfectly aligned along a southeasterly vector 
and perhaps uniquely separated by spaces in the same stone, a unique example of craftsmanship. Red porphyry is a very hard stone, as heavy as granite. The monoliths are about 13 feet high, six and a half feet wide, and three to six feet thick. They weigh from 25 to 50 tons. They were quarried from a nearby mountain, so obviously they were cut from the rock face, taken down into the valley, and then dragged 328 feet up to their destination. How? Archaeologists mention thousands of workers, ropes, tree trunks, and potatoes used as lubricant to help the massive monolith slide. That's right, potatoes. The structure is obviously incomplete, as the blocks scattered haphazardly around the summit confirm, but nobody knows what its intended use was or why it was never finished. Another enigma puzzles us in the midst of so many mysteries, a symbol carved on one of the monoliths. A pyramid rising in steps, the same symbol also found in Egypt. Is it just a coincidence? The Incas certainly had no knowledge of the Egyptians, but could both civilizations have been inspired by the same matrix? In his book, Operation Fawcett, the legendary explorer Colonel Percy Fawcett wrote, the Incas inherited their fortresses and cities from an earlier civilization, and Garcilaso de la Vega in his chronicles tells us how they had been erected in the first age before the Incas. The first age, what does it mean? Was it the age when the gods could fly? The age when the survivors of an ancient, highly developed civilization settled in Peru? We have evidence of this because here in Peru we've studied the pre-Inca cultures. 10,000 years ago there was the Chimu civilization, which means those from Mu. Further south, there was the Muchique civilization, sometimes called Muchica, but the correct name is Muchique, or descendants of Mu, coming from Mu. We leave from the little station at Ollantaytambo. The train wends its slow way next to the river through the Urubamba Valley, the sacred valley of the Incas. The countryside is interesting, harsh and wild. It gets greener the further we go. Finally, we arrive in Machu Picchu, sacred myth of the past and present. We get off at the station in Aguas Calientes. This little town is at the foot of the mountain where the lost city of the Incas is sited. It has grown rapidly in a chaotic fashion, thanks to the influx of tourists from all over the world. We shouldered the equipment we need to film and set off towards the archaeological site. The road we take is the steepest. It leads to one of the highest points which dominate the city. The climb is tiring. We still haven't got acclimatized to the altitude here. But the magic of the place has already enthralled us. We're impatient. We can't wait to see the legendary monuments of one of the most fascinating cities of the ancient world. Machu Picchu, the lost city of the Incas, emerged from the mists of time in 1911. The American explorer Hiram Bingham, professor at Yale University, is the author of the discovery. As a matter of fact, the Peruvian archaeologist Agustin Lizarraga had discovered the ruins before him in 1902, and two families of campesinos were found living there, farming the ancient terraces left by the Incas. Bingham had the merit of studying the site scientifically and telling the world about this amazing urban structure. Without taking any merit away from Bingham, he was the one who made Machu Picchu world famous, but it was the Peruvians who guided him to Machu Picchu. 
That's important to remember. There were people here before, and people came to Machu Picchu from Cusco many years before Mr. Bingham. When was it built? What was it for? Was it a fortified settlement? A refuge for the noble Inca class, or a city dedicated to the cult of the gods? There are many theories, but no sure answers. Yet the stones speak. Machu Picchu is a silent voice with many tales to tell if you listen carefully. Machu Picchu, a saga in stone at 7,800 feet above sea level, is perfectly integrated with its surroundings. So much so that it looks almost like a natural feature rather than a man-made construction. The logic behind so many great works. The sacred rock reproduces the profile of the nearby mountain. In a fantastic play of light and shadows, the profile of an Indios emerges from the shape of the mountains against the skyline. An incredible coincidence. In the Condor Temple, sculpted and natural elements blend to bring the sacred animal to life. Its wings of stone capture a moment of flight for all eternity. The Water Temple. Water, another sacred element for the Incas. The mysterious mortar room. It's in what is known as the industrial area. The Incas were believed to have dyed material in the two rocks shaped like mortars. Material they then dried in the cylinders protruding from the walls. But is this the right explanation? Magical Machu Picchu, scattered fragments from a lost arcane world. The houses of the ordinary people were near the agricultural sector, with its barns and characteristic terraces. The houses are stone-built, small and simple. Once through the main gates of the city, the path winds through some narrow streets and then leads to a strangely shaped building. Bingham called it the Torion, or Tower. Today it's known as the Temple of the Sun. It's built to a semicircular plan with two trapezoidal windows set in the curved wall. One faces north and the other faces east. They can be used to determine the summer and winter solstices. There is a niche with structures carved into the lower part of the building. Its purpose was to determine important astronomic events. The Torion is more than a temple. It's an astronomic calendar in stone and it's not the only one in Machu Picchu. The temple with the three windows is in the middle level of the city and the alignment of the openings enables the equinoxes to be calculated. The same as the monolithic stones of Stonehenge in England. Stone is the great protagonist of the ancient world. But on a higher level, behind a three-walled building reached by a flight of roughly hewn steps, we find an even more sophisticated astronomic structure. The Intihuatana is a polygonal structure cut into the living rock. The precision is extraordinary. A spur of rock like a cog on the upper surface is perfectly aligned to the northeast-southeast. An accurate sundial for calculating the solstices and the equinoxes. Machu Picchu is incredible. It's more like a huge stone computer for astronomical calculus rather than a city. It's true that here at Machu Picchu there are important sectors both on the lower and higher levels. The actual position of the city it was placed in the best position to receive solar energy. That's very clear in Machu Picchu. You can see both the sunrise and the sunset. It's positioned to receive as much solar energy as possible all year round. Could the Inca Empire have developed such sophisticated knowledge? These are precise technical instruments, not simple ritual symbols. They're backed up by precise geometrical calculations, mathematics and astronomy. Only a civilization that developed over a long period of time could have produced anything like them. Machu Picchu means the old mountain, but how old actually is it? According to the archaeologists, the city was built in the 15th century. But in 1930, Professor Rolf Müller from the University of Potsdam in Germany 
studied the astronomic alignments of the Torion, the temple with the three windows, and the Intihuatana, and established that they had been built sometime between 4000 and 2000 BC. These incredible dates were confirmed by further studies carried out by the astronomers Deborn and White from Arizona University. Does this mean that here, as in other sites, the Incas settled on pre-existing structures? The dates calculated by the astronomers confirm this theory. Local oral traditions that have been handed down to the present day also tell of ancient gods who initiated civilization and built wonderful cities, gods who could fly, perhaps the survivors of the highly developed civilization of Mu. On the sacred square of Machu Picchu, the Temple of the Three Windows, the main temple and the other structures are all built from perfectly fitted together polygonal blocks. The by now familiar joints, already seen in Cuzco and Saksai Yuaman. We find similar differences in other parts of the city. The difference in style and technique used to build Machu Picchu are glaringly obvious. Carefully crafted monoliths make up the older part and rougher workmanship on the later parts. Once more, we find different styles and levels of technical ability. Were they built by different people? How else can we explain the difference? But we have other mysteries to unravel. We want to know if there were any underground tunnels at Machu Picchu, and are told that when maintenance work was being done on the sacred square, where the main temple is, the workmen heard echoes as if the ground below was hollow. Some digging was done, but only to a depth of a few feet, without finding anything. Perhaps the cavities are further down. A guide who heard about our research said that there were some tunnels in another area. He offers to take us there. After a difficult scramble, we come to the narrow entrance. The young guide climbs down first. It's a tight squeeze. Even passing the equipment we need to explore and film is difficult. We can't really take all we need, but we decide to make do. Once we're in, walking isn't easy. The tunnel is very irregular. It seems as if it had only been started and not completed. It's very damp, and the ground underfoot is very slippery, so we have to be careful. After a certain distance, the tunnel is blocked, and we can't go any further. Getting back is even more difficult, but we have the proof that someone had created underground tunnels at Machu Picchu too. The sun is setting as we emerge from the narrow tunnel. The ancient city is hauntingly beautiful and had shared some of its secrets with us. Our minds are echoing with the words of Colonel Fawcett. The Indios tribes inherited the traditions of a great civilization. Perhaps they were the ancestors of the Incas, perhaps a mysterious race who left behind the gigantic remains that the invading Incas later incorporated into their own buildings. Historical civilizations all have a common matrix, albeit a forgotten one. Even Colonel Fawcett was convinced of the truth of this. The huge ruins scattered around Peru and other countries around the world are an obvious clue confirmed by their identical construction technique. The myths and traditions of many ancient people have handed down the memory of this civilization. There are mysterious tunnels at these ancient sites. Perhaps these clues are still not enough to prove the existence of a lost civilization which gave rise to all successive civilizations. There is still a lot to discover and the research goes on.